Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Christians suffer in a myriad of ways, none of which are random, all of which are God-designed, customized for each one of us. And they are always, always for our good. Romans 8, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the, of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Sometimes this is difficult to grasp in a time of trouble. Maybe you feel helpless. You feel to blame. You feel afraid. You worry. Uh, you're thrown completely off balance. Like sometimes you feel like you're not even living in your own world. Uh, like people don't even know that you exist. You're downtrodden. You find yourself judging others. There's a lot of inward feelings there. Outwardly, well, there's thousands of physical handicaps. But together, these inward and the, these outward trials are parcels of the spiritual growth process, and they can be intense. Christians suffer. James chapter 1, consider, that's, that's, a, uh, that's your leading thought in your mind, to esteem or regard highly something, Consider it pure joy. I think joy is grace recognized. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you encounter trials of many kinds because you know, you have a perfect knowledge because of this book, you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance that is a patient, enduring Allow perseverance to finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial among you taking place as if some strange thing were happening to you. Obviously, the Lord knew what our thoughts would be. Now, I could give you what I think is good advice and, you know, what you ought to do when stuff happens, but that puts the burden on you to succeed, to persevere through suffering, through your own efforts. I'd say make no rash decisions. Don't sit in self-pity. Uh, don't cuss. Don't kick the cat. You know, just love everybody, love one another. The greatest of these is love. Love fulfills the law. Love endures forever. These are, these are true. These things are true. Love does bring peace through all the mysteries of trials in life. Love transcends time and space and so on and so forth. You know, remain calm, slow down, pray. God listens. We know He listens. You're not lost. You're not alone. Take care of your health. Don't do anything self-destructive. That's all good advice. But God's promises are more intense than any trial. Mere advice would be law. That's the worldly self-help concept. And dearly beloved, you are not of the world. In the world, but not of the world. Thousands of books have flown off the shelves with that concept. Problem is, it, it leaves Christ out of the equation completely. Today, God operates a different way, and that is by grace through faith in His promises. Nothing, nothing helps us through the difficulties, the hardships, the tragedies of life, more than knowing and trusting God concerning His promises. They are attitude changers. 
whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. 2 Peter 1.4 I know it's not easy. But by trusting in God's faithfulness, God's goodness, God's love, God's sovereignty, you know, perhaps you'll look back in sweet memory on how God sustained you through a most difficult time in your life. Perhaps it's the, the most difficult time in your life. God knows our hearts. And I think He delights in fulfilling the desires of our hearts. But many times, He answers our prayers in strange ways. He knows what's best for us. I've asked God to give me wisdom in suffering. And He did. He brought about an even greater period of suffering. <laughs> like, uh, you know, you lose someone dear to you, you ask Him for help. And you lose someone else dear to you. I, Exactly the opposite of how you expected that God would act. So, you know, be careful what you wish for. And if it's your heart's desire to truly know Him, know that that, that will not happen apart from suffering. It leads us to faith. When God created, He created time. And one of the great gifts that we have from God is time. Twice we are told in His Word that we should redeem the time. And we have the promise of the Holy Spirit that when that time is used for the Lord, you'll never give it up. I want to give you seven assurances that we have from the Lord from the 17th chapter of John. His high priestly prayer uh, as some people call it. Stop and think for a moment that Jesus Christ is not some man that was born in Bethlehem of Judea some 2,000 years ago. Jesus Christ came in the flesh and the clear inference, of course, is His pre-existence. The Lord that we worship, the Lord that we know is the sovereign God of eternity. He didn't begin 2,000 years ago. He always was. And He deigned to become our kinsman redeemer, taking on flesh so that He might be our substitute and redeem us totally, paying the price. When you stop to think that He's God in flesh, then it is inconceivable, it is impossible that Christ would pray or could pray anything that was not God's will. And it's astounding how many sermons are preached on Christ's prayer in the garden that he'd like to get out of going to the cross. We have the testimony of Scripture. Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will. He said that before he ever came. Are we to suggest that it, in His entire earthly ministry, He came to do the will of the Father and now He wants to get out of it? The point I'm simply making is that what Christ prayed has to be God's will. More than that, it must come to pass. If you don't know that, then you don't know the Lord as God Almighty. It is inconceivable that He could pray anything, anything, that was not His will as God. And if it is His will, it must, must come to pass. In the second verse of the 17th chapter, He says, As thou hast given Him power over all flesh, that He should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given Him. Eternal life. You know, eternal life isn't something like a baseball that you, you know, just throw away. You, you know, you can have it or not have it. It is life that never ends. No matter what the circumstances are, you have eternal life with God. That is absolutely God's will. And Christ prayed that you have that. 
In the 10th verse, he prays, All are mine and all mine are thine. And thine are mine and I'm glorified in them. Well, he's glorified in some, right? But, you know, most of y'all lived, you know, such a rotten life, he can't be glorified, all right? Folks, you can't do that with this prayer. They're his. Are some more his than others? Well, you can't, you can't say that. Every single one of us are just as precious to Christ. We belong to God and we belong to Christ. God chose us before the foundation of the world. Christ died in our place. What is God? What is God's is Christ's, and what is Christ's is God's. All mine are thine, all thine are mine. Clearly, the Lord Jesus Christ is God, and we belong to Him. We don't belong to the world system. We don't belong to Satan. We don't belong to ourselves. We're His, and every one of us is precious in His sight. The 11th verse. I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. Holy Father, keep thou thine own. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. That they may be one as we are. Now that's his prayer. I don't know how many times I've heard someone ask me to get involved in some movement so that we, we all might be one as Christ prayed. You know, I mean, wouldn't it be nice if Christ's prayer were answered? When the inference clearly is that it was. If Christ's prayer is not answered, then it's not the will of God. We have the testimony of Scripture. If you ask anything according to the will of God, He'll do it. We are one. No human effort is going to make us one. No groups or Facebook uh, you know, organizations or churches that, that get together to try to come up with some kind of an agreement that all are willing to compromise enough to accept will make us one. We are one because we are His. We're not one because we act like one. We're not one because we have agreed to get together and try to be one. We are one because we are His. Keep these that are in the world, Holy Father. Keep through Thine own name those whom Thou hast given Me that they may be one. That is an assurance that you have. That you and I have. You're not only one, but you're kept. Guarded is the word. Tereo in the Greek. If you're not guarded, then Christ's prayer is not answered. Verse 15, I pray not that you should take them out of the world, but that you keep them in the world and keep them from the evil. It's articulated. It's amazing how many preachers try to come up with sermons to make sure that you're kept from evil. You know, try to work out some way, the way you live your life and the, the things that you do so that you'll be kept from evil and you'll bring glory to the Lord. And I've never, never heard one of them refer to the 15th verse of the 17th chapter of John. Christ's prayer to God is that you be kept from the evil. You suppose you will be? Well, what if you're not? Christ prayed that you would be kept from the evil, so you will be. Here's a promise that you will be kept from the evil. You may, not, you may not think that. You may not believe that. You know, people have said to me, Steve, you know, you don't know how much I sin. And I say, I don't want to know. I don't want to know that. If you're a new creation in Christ Jesus, you are kept from the evil. I believe because it's because you have a new creation that you're kept. The 17th verse, I pray that you sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now there's a tremendous move in Christianity today that you need to settle down and you need to sanctify yourself. And folks, there is not one single passage of Scripture that ever exhorts you to sanctify yourself. 
It's always God who does it. And He does it through truth. Truth. Paul says, I pray God that your whole body, soul, and spirit be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord. I hear that quoted a lot. You know the next verse. Faithful is He that called you who also will do it. He will do it. Christ pray that you be sanctified, that God set you apart for Himself. You suppose He did? Suppose He didn't. Well, think what that would mean. Well, Christ, God Almighty, incarnate in human flesh, flesh he, he prayed something that didn't happen. You're not only guarded from the evil, you are set apart to God. The 23rd verse, He's praying, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and has loved them as thou hast loved me, made perfect in one. All we have to do there is move to Colossians. You are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. You don't look that way. You may not look that way, but you are. There's absolutely nothing, nothing that needs to be done. As far as you're concerned, in God's presence, you are holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. Think about it. That God would love them as He loved Christ. In that 23rd verse, how much do you suppose God the Father loved God the Son? Can you imagine that He loves you the same way? Love them as thou hast loved me. Think of it. That Almighty God loves you as He loved Christ Himself. And then last of all, the 24th verse. Father, I will that they also whom Thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory that Thou hast given me. For You loved me before the foundation of the world. There is scriptural testimony to the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. God of very God. But think of it. I also pray, and it's my will, that they be with me. It is staggering the number of sermons that are preached on what you have to do to make sure that you're going to be with Him. Tremendous numbers of exhortations that take your mind off of Christ and put them down here in the garbage pit in which you live. This is a testimony of Jesus Christ Himself and what He's done for you. I'm not suggesting that you don't have any responsibilities, but folks, they're all vested in love. And to sit and make a list of things that Christians ought to do and not do will not work separate from the love of God. Here are seven tremendous truths that are yours, not only for today, but for eternity, for the rest of your time here on earth. They must be true because they are the will of God. We need to know and remember who He is, especially in a time of great difficulty or suffering. Know what He's done for us and the promise that He'll return for us. It is Christ Jesus who died for you, who paid your sin debt in full, are you bringing any human works or any human goodness or any human merit? Or do you come before the Lord and say, yes, I recognize that I have life because You gave me life, that I'm alive because You died in my place, and I understand the depth and the integrity of that sacrifice. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You for Your grace and for Your mercy and for the privilege that we have to fellowship together for a few moments in the things of grace. May our Lord receive the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Join us in Galatians on Sunday. I love you all. I truly do. Please remember me and Sue in, in prayer. Sue's going undergoing some tests in the hospital.
this incident's what prompted this video. And so, you know, it's, it's often been said that the, more than anything, preachers need to listen to their own video.